Okay, quick, uh, two, two, three quick announcements. One is on page seven of the latest issue of Transaction Advisors, you will see the schedule, uh, which includes the dates March 19th and 20th of 2019. So we'll be back here at the Wharton campus next year in March, March 19th and 20th. So uh, please save the date and mm -hmm. Let me know if you are interested in not only attending, but also participating. If you'd like to take part in some of the discussions and we can put you on the hot seat. I see Jeff, who I've been recruiting among others. <laughs> so with a good bit of notice, I'm hoping to uh, uh, put together a good composition again for next year. So please let me know if you have an interest in participating. Uh, in the meantime, you might also enjoy our program at the University of Chicago in September. Um, we are then out in New York uh, in May. So uh, please take a look at the dates. And uh, again, hopefully you will either attend or participate if you're up for that. Uh, second quick announcement, again, an appeal to weigh in on the surveys. The net promoter score number we hold on to very closely. Um, so please let us know how we're doing and again, what topics and issues we should address in the future. Uh, third and final is a CLE and CPE credit. Please don't forget to sign in. They require these things to be buttoned down. Um, now on to the discussion at hand. Um, we are fortunate to have two, um, some interesting, two, two interesting things to point to. One is the um, M&A retention playbook, which uh, you are welcome to take home and use and reference, um, as well as the art and science of retaining talent. This, um, again, is a basis of research that is fundamental to the discussion and really, again, hits to the spirit of the way we wanna address these issues with a grounding of expertise and a depth and breadth of understanding. Um, and we're certainly honored to have Jeff Cox lead this next session, uh, one of the authors of this very impressive study. Um, and he's gonna lead us through this discussion on flight risk and hopefully not flighting, but <laughs> retaining the talent that you've acquired. So take it away, Jeff. Thanks, William. Well, I know we're in between you and Uncle Ted's uh, Pinot Noir and uh, Chardonnay, so we'll get you out here promptly. Uh, but we saved the best for last. Uh, we, my group does about 1,200 transactions a year globally. We work both on the buy and the sell side for traditional uh, strategics and also financial sponsors, predominantly private equity, with some of the emerging direct investors in sovereign wealth, the large family offices, uh, pension funds predominantly in Canada that do direct investing. 60% uh, cross-border. Uh, we believe that the common denominator driving economic value across geography and industry is people, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And we pull a little bit of an audible. If you look at your uh, brochure, it talks about the relevance. We were gonna talk about the case study, and when we had our prep session, it occurred to me that the experience of the group up here on the panel was so extremely valuable that we'd stop and not talk about the case study and talk about their actual experiences. I think collectively they have over 40 years of experiences in uh, the <laughs> transaction space. <laughs> and um, Natalia, why don't we start with you? Why don't you give us a little background on your, uh, sure. not your 40 years in the industry. <laughs> That'd be uh, pretty but, bad. Uh, a little background on you <laughs> yep. and, and then we'll move on to uh, James. Happy to. So Natalia Carvajal, I work for Microsoft. I lead the integration management team. A couple of things to note about Microsoft and how we're a little bit unique is um, we call ourselves venture integration, yet we do not do ventures. So one, one point of clarification, we really are just the integration management team and we're separate from corp dev and separate from biz dev. So that kind of gives us a little bit of separation from church and state. Um, I've been at Microsoft for about a year now. I actually just had my anniversary yesterday. Um, so pretty happy to be there. But I've been doing M&A for, uh, we calculated 13 years now. I started right after business school doing M&A um, integration for uh, Deloitte. I did that for about five years. And then I actually went internal at Deloitte and did um, Corp Dev for Deloitte proper. That was under the assumption that I was not gonna be traveling as much. And so um, I believe them. Uh, a few months into my role, we acquired a company in Mexico. And they're like, oh, with your experience, you'd be perfect for this role. Why don't you help us integrate it? So um, that's when I decided it was time to leave for good. I then took a 
hiatus of sorts from M&A, and I started a company with a couple business school classmates, and it was a completely different space, so that was doing HR. Um, like it was in the HR space, we did like benefits and payroll for small companies. And then I really realized that I missed the m and world, so decided to go back. I went into corporate, first at Adobe. I was part of their m and integration team, and then Groupon called to see if I could start the, the team, the m and integration team there that done a number of transactions. They didn't really have a M&A team, M&A integration team whatsoever. They had an integrated of the companies that acquired. And so I came in, I implemented the playbook, and it was great because I could kind of leverage all the things that I'd enjoyed from the different companies that I worked at and like the things that had worked and didn't work at Deloitte, I kind of you know just picked. Um, and I created that group. And about three years later, Microsoft called. We were thinking about moving back to the Bay Area or the West Coast in general. And this just seemed like a really great opportunity. It's you know, much larger company, bigger acquisitions, a lot more acquisitive, and I'd be managing a much more mature team. And so I thought it'd be great. They were, you know, they have a pretty robust practice. So like we've you know been doing this for a long time, a great playbook, but they were looking for that external perspective to bring the practice even further. And this is a topic that to us is very near and dear to our heart. Most of the transactions we do are either talent acquisitions or technology acquisitions. And for us, it's not just the retention, but it's really how do we keep these people engaged? We're paying for the talent. We don't want them just to be part of this next great thing. We want them to be part of our journey at Microsoft. Wonderful. Uh, for those of you guys sitting in the back, you got to check out James's uh, socks <laughs> after uh, over wine. But James, you're, I love those, so you're nice at the bat there. So I'm James Harris. I'm, I've been doing a corporate integration at uh, Google for about six and a half years. And prior to that, I worked at uh, Amazon and then uh, F5 Networks. So overall, it's been about 15 years of doing integration. Um, we, like you and Natalia, we, we definitely look at uh, the people as the key component of a lot of the deals. We actually break them down into talent, tech and talent, business, and then other, uh, which can be other is always interesting. Um, and, but all of those, you know, the key, key metric of all our deal approvals is the talent retention and talent success. Um, and that's actually, we'll also, I'll also segue on the buy and sell side. On the buy side, we actually track the employees for four years in their success. And we actually compare them to the cohort of employees that come in as regular recruits. Um, and that gives us a sense of how, what we're getting the real value for. Um, you know, sometimes we buy a deal, we realize that the, maybe the technology wasn't quite what the fit was, but the team goes off and does something else, we consider that a success. Um, I would say the other side is, is that we do an awful lot of acquisitions. It's not a, uh, unusual piece and so there's lots of opportunity to make connections and have people kind of understand or have, you know somebody in your team has probably come in also through an acquisition somewhere along the way um, on the sell side we actually think about the same thing is that talent is those people and when we think about doing a divestiture or a spin out um, we look at how to incent them to stay um, and some of that starts with kind of as we start the senior executive team we actually teach a managing change class and we give them kind of an opportunity to get a handle on that change that's going to go come through. We uh, then we as we expand out into the employee group, and then we'll teach them that. And so everybody has kind of a common framework to look at as far as they're making through it, making through that transition. You know, compensation is a big uh, piece of it as far as like equity. Is we do spend a lot of time thinking about equity bridges, and we think about how we're going to bridge the Google equity to the new startup. And so if you're kind of going from a very sure thing and you're getting nice stock to high risk, high reward, we kind of build plans based on each buyer on how we kind of going to transition those people over. Because we don't want people to feel like they have a sense of loss when they're being divested or spinning out. So you know, we really spend a lot of time thinking about the people. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about it. Great, thanks James. Todd? Well, I guess if uh, they ran the numbers, I'm the remainder. Um, <laughs> I, I, I fell into m and uh, integration work uh, kind of serendipitously. I uh, had been at a couple startups that were eventually acquired, but I was never on that uh, trail of, of being party to the event. And uh, what eventually got me into the integration space was back in 2007 when Cisco bought WebEx. I had been at Cisco for a about a year and a half and word got out there's this ex webexer in the hallways you might know something about what we just bought um and uh, you know funny i've talked with james and known james for a long time uh, i have 
one of the other startups I was at was acquired by Google and I wasn't there. Um, but my friends who <laughs> were acquired are still there and, and lovingly joke, you know, Google never would have hired me, but you know, I'm <laughs> glad I got acquired. So, um, you know, I, I came up through the integration space at Cisco, um, saw a lot of small deals, a couple big deals that transformed how that organization really looked and worked through their integration practices. Um, went through some methodology changes while I was there. So seen a, seen a couple different things of how, you know, deals have, uh, have transgressed. And I'd say probably one of the things that was really impressed upon me um, early on is just kind of an evolution. And I've kind of adopted this as, you know, something that I try to, you know, set up as one of my own guidelines is really, you know, I have a foot in both kind of the deal side of corp dev and the integration side. So I run the IMO at Symantec now, um, but I partner closely with um, the deal team and usually it's a, you know, we're kind of two in the box. Um, but I, I really have my radar turned high on making sure that early on in the process, there is a high aptitude and understanding that it is the people in the deal that really are paramount to the value and really the long-term success of what you're trying to accomplish. You know, at the end of the day, someone or a team put in a lot of hard sweat and work and effort to really create something that you value. So, you know, to it, it's a disservice not to pay the attention that you need to in the process to understand how is that going to really be a win-win at the end of the integration. So I partner closely with the corp dev team so that they understand that, hey, I'm putting this importance on the fact that, you know, I'm managing some integration activities down the line, then I want to make sure that this relationship that we're, we're pulling together really benefits everyone. Good. Well, Todd, why don't we start with you uh, with the first question. At, at what point in the deal process do you guys identify and lock down talent? I'd say it starts with the initial conversation. You know, the initial conversation that you have when you're, you know, being introduced to the company and you get a sense to, you know, the openness that either the executive team or the founders have as you have that first conversation really kind of sets the tone. Um, I'm big on, you know, nonverbal communications and I can just sense it. You know, I'm, uh, I may look like I'm dominating this chair. I'm six, nine, and it feels like a little stool, but you know, I'm, I'm really, you know, I come into a conference room and I, I'm even attuned to, okay, is my chair too high? I don't want to feel like I'm, you know, encroaching on someone's personal space. So if we have a glass of wine later, I'm not going to get, you know, so close that you feel like there's this giant next to you. Um, but I think it starts there. Um, I really, you know, and, and, and I look at it as, you know, this is an exciting journey that we're going down, you know, should it, you know, come to fruition that we do do the deal. I want to be a steward of creating goodwill and I want to make sure that I understand who the, who my partner in crime is across the table. And as more of their peers and colleagues get involved, really starting to build an opinion. And I think as we, as you go through diligence and more people get involved, you start building kind of a collective wisdom around kind of a gut feel like, hey, this is a good team. We want to keep this team together or, hey, you know, let's carve this off, but keep that and promote these. Uh, it informs you and, and truly every deal is different because of just the personal dynamics of, of who you're working with. And we, we talked, I think, uh, about there are a select few group of companies that actually have um, employment agreements signed off on with the talent that they're acquiring before they sign their purchase agreement. Is that any comments there? Or? Yeah, I mean, we'll look at you know what we see is the key the key people that we need to lock that are going to kind of have the influence and and the ability to kind of send those signals out to their organization that hey, you know, I'm I was the founder. I've been here for ten years, and and this is a good thing for us. And here's why. It could also be maybe not someone in the executive suite. It could be a, a key software architect or some, um, you know, machine learning guy who is the, 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 the diamond in the rough, um, you know, that, that influencer behind the scenes. And, you know, to that point, one of the things that we definitely do is if there's key talent and what, you know, whether it's the founders or just named employees on the engineering side or, you know, any other area that is critical to us, we may put that as a condition for close. Absolutely, same thing. Because, you know, you want to make sure, you know, we'll say 75% or, you know, whatever number we think is appropriate of those people need to accept 
prior to close as part of the closing condition, especially if we're talking about a, a talent acquisition, which is a lot of what we do. That way, you're guaranteed that those people are going to be coming with a transaction. Because you know, the last thing you want is to you know, put all this effort, do the due diligence, figure out who are the employees that you want to bring over, and then you close the transaction and none of them are coming. <laughs> yeah, that hurts. It does. It does. <laughs> it does. And so you know, as, as, as we're kind of going through the process, we identify who those people are, we add that to the closing condition, and then we start looking at what are some of the things that we can do to really engage those people that we want to bring over. So what are their interests? What do they want to do, not only as part of the transaction, but like, you know, where do they see themselves five, 10 years down the road? And then we identify people in the company, the broader Microsoft organization, that can be kind of like their partner in crime. We'll assign them. And then you know, obviously, we'll wait until we sign and close. And then shortly after, we'll assign those people as peers who can then help them navigate um, you know, the, the broader Microsoft. A lot of these people are entrepreneurs. They like that entrepreneurial world and, and coming into a Microsoft or a Google, you know, it, it's overwhelming. And so figure out ways to make their life a lot simpler. Um, and so, you know, we've kind of identified a couple of things. That's one of them. But another one, which is very simple and we had never thought about this, is assigning an admin. If you think about it, you know, when, when you bring someone from the outside and you just hire an, an amazing engineer, they come into an ecosystem. When you hire an entire team, they don't have that. And so how do you make sure that they're connected to the broader team? And admins have a whole knowledge that nobody else does in the company, and they know who everybody is. So that's been something that we've been doing very successfully for the last couple of years to kind of keep them engaged. Um, and then you know, in a, in a similar fashion, um, it's like just, just determine you know, what are the, the really cool things that the company is working on, and then maybe bring them to some of those really cool meetings and just kind of get them really truly involved in the organization as a whole. And how, how many deals do you guys close a year? It really varies you know, year by year. Um, this year, it's probably going to be about 13, 14. Last year, uh, we had somewhere around 20. Uh, that was a pretty big year for us. The year before, it was 22. But I would say our sweet spot, it's sweet spot is anywhere between 10 and 15. So the stakes are high. It goes well beyond retention. It's about engagement. It absolutely, it really is. James, I was going to say, I love that admin idea. That's a great one. I mean, that's a. Um, so we we do when we think about it, we we start at the beginning like you, and we actually identify key employees. We actually walk through the entire org as part of that our process. We actually look at what each individual is. We have conversations about who we think should stay, who should who who may not. Um, we um, then look at. As we're looking through this, we actually sit down with the sponsors who are actually going through this, and we start asking them, how are you going to mentor these people? What are you going to do to make sure they're successful? What buddies are you going to do? Um, what we, we have a term called Sherpas, which are engineering people that we embed into the team that can start to answer the dumb questions about, how do I check this in, or where do I get this? And what are, what are those kind of connection points there? And we start really advocating for that, and particularly the remote, that's a must. Um, Additionally, what we do is, is we actually have an executive coach on our team, and they spend time with the sponsors and the, exec the founders, helping them through that transition. And we actually do have some very pointed conversations with them, which is things you learned that made you successful as a startup, you may actually have to unlearn to be successful at Google. And we just have those direct conversations. We have them with the sponsor, with the inquired employee, you know, the senior management, to get them to actually start having these conversations. Um, definitely, we approach them very carefully, but um, we want to be very clear and, and candid with them. We also have a very large number of uh, founders that have stayed at Google, and we connect them up with them and say, you know, go talk to these other people. Um, actually, one of the things I do as I'm looking at the deal is, is I'm looking at the executive team and who can I match, you know, who are similar people that I will introduce to as part of that. No, that's a, that's a good point. I know that we've taken a lot of pride in like fostering those good relationships yeah. with prior founders and executives so that we can say, hey, Sanjay, come here. We've got it, you know, someone we want you to meet and tell them about how it went for you. Yeah, yeah, because it's yeah, it's the point there, it's like, you know, don't believe me. Yeah. Talk to them. I mean that's a better, way better interaction. The other thing we do do is, is we consciously watch how senior team and even the exec, you know, the senior management responds during the deal. It's a crucible. We see them rise to the best and some sink to the worst. Um, and we look for those signals. And when we oftentimes, I'll sit down with a new VP that is you know, bringing this team in and I'll say, so and so, when they start to do this, 
they're highly stressed. You know, you need to watch for that. When they're doing this, they're really happy. Um, and so, I mean, one engineer said, you know, he's got a very stern face. He, he, he basically he says, you know, I'm always smiling on the inside. And I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> but you know, it's like, yeah, if you look at him, you're like, you'd be terrified that he's like, he's just not getting any of this, but he's actually pretty happy. So yeah, just letting him know that, it was just kind of this simple thing, but it just makes that easy, that transition. I mean, it's, it's all about that change. Excellent. Well, the next question is yours. Uh, William referred to our research and we see on the cell side, uh, we, we see one particular aspect of what they call a transaction bonus, locking people down. There may be a prolonged period of uh, regulatory review. On the buy side, we're, we're seeing a shift, particularly that we've been in a seller's market for a couple of years now. It used to be corporate development sent a number down maybe to somebody in HR and said, here's how much you have to spend uh, to keep people around. And there seems to be a dramatic shift with those successful acquirers that are keeping people post-close and driving economic value. And that's what we call a bottoms up approach. And it's going and identifying those key people that are critical to driving the day-to-day -day success of the business and then moving your way up with the litmus test at the end to make sure you're not overspending as a percentage of deal value. But you know, James, you guys have got a pretty buttoned up process from start to finish. Uh, what, what should it look like to hedge flight risk and lock down the right town. So I think, you know, we look at it in, for, from three vectors. I mean, uh, comp is a, a piece of it, and I'll come back to it at the end. The first one really is most of these are engineering talent. And uh, engineers, if you can get them to understand that they're gonna go solve great problems or work on great issues or be part of something that's really big, that usually gets them kind of beginning, you win their minds. Um, you know, one of the things that we have that's, you know, in our favor is, is we can talk to them about the fact that whatever you have done, you probably have not done it at Google scale. And here's a real opportunity for you to see something at operate at a scale that you just, it'll, it'll bake your noodle every time. Uh, most people are excited about that. Um, we also, uh, we have a very fluid uh, infrastructure. So we, you know, we allow, we really want people to move around. And so oftentimes we'll talk about the fact that, you know, we brought you in, you're part of an acquisition, we want you to kind of maybe deliver, you know, get something onboarded with us or help deliver a feature. But after that, you're kind of the captain of your own career and you can go off and do other things. And truly there are other things. And we see people, we actually point to a handful of leaders. One of my favorite is Nan Bowden, who came in as a CEO. She's now running the whole partnership group for cloud. And here's an example of somebody who came in, realized that they could do something, actually really wanted to pivot and learn something entirely different. And she's completely reinvented her career and is entirely happy there. But we do, you know, we look at money almost as the last piece um, because we really want to think about we want people that are be excited about being at the company for the value that they can bring to their customers, not you know monetary. So the so the value proposition is career. Yep. Uh, the brand. Yeah. Right? Working yeah. for Alphabet, I think we're. Yeah, I, and most people feel like they've won the lottery when they you know come <laughs> to Google. I mean, as an engineer, I'll have to say the infrastructure and the tools are just highly optimized for engineers. I mean. Uh, um, it is super easy to code. It's a great, you know, the, the whole company is focused on trying to get code out the door. So, um, yeah, if you're wanting to do that, you're in, you're in heaven. Good. All right. <laughs> um, Natalia? Um, yeah, I think, you know, very similar, yeah. right? So, like, for us, it's, it's all about, it's very similar, right? So, like, money is the last resource in the tool set that we have. I think for us, the first thing is, how do you keep them engaged and happy, which, comes with, okay, make it very clear to them what the value prop of the deal is. Mm -hmm. What is it that they're here to do? Um, and then based on that, you kind of have a, you know, a story for what their next four years are gonna look like. Um, and then in addition to that, one of the things we do is when we, prior to close, we kind of sit down and we look at the org mm -hmm. and we start doing the, our org development and kind of figuring out, okay, the, based on the skills that these people have, what are some of the other things that we could see them doing mm -hmm at the broader organization? What are some of like the, the bets that the company's having where we think we could pull some of these people out and actually have them um, kind of engaged in that area? So we're always thinking not only about the current bet, but also you know just far, far in the horizon where are some other things that they could be doing. Um, and then I think probably another thing is, one of the things that we do when, as far as like the engagement, which when I was talking in the beginning, is we have um, round tables for acquired employees. And so 
getting that network going and strong. And then every time we do a new acquisition on a quarterly basis, we have presentations where we have a panel of former acquired employees, and then we have a panel of current Microsoft engineering leads to kind of get them really well aligned with the organization as a whole. Um, so very similar to James' story, like cash for us is usually the last alternative because a lot of these companies that we acquire, especially the founders, by the time you close a transaction, they could walk out the door and not work another day in yeah, their lives. So we really are that. always looking at how do we just make it interesting? So brand, working on really cool new technology. So we're always looking at, okay, well, what, what are the hot topics mm -hmm. now? So AI is a big one for us, right? And so like, how do we get them engaged in that area? Do they have the skill set? Or maybe, you know, the product that they're working on, could we somehow align it to a really cool project that you know, may make them think about, you know what, I want to stick here for a long time and not just because I got acquired. And Todd, how about you guys? What's going on over at Samantha? Yeah, well, I think you, know, you referenced the, the, the phrase story. And I think it's important that you know, there may be a small number of people who are really involved with the deal you know, at, the, at the target. And perhaps you know, as things get closer to really this momentous opportunity, you know, the, the aperture widens and more people start finding out whether it's, you know, psst, hey, we're getting bought or, or something, you know, of a, you know, a town hall and everyone's having pizza and beer. Um, when, I, when I go back to the story, um, and it goes back to flight risk, if you're not able to articulate a clear story and vision to the target around what their vision and, and, and how they come in and, and add value to your organization, if you brush over that, you're going to have people in the room who are going to write their own story. And when people in the room can't latch on to that vision or, or kind of that, that journey that they want to take, they may go to a story that is, you know, dark and you know, in a corner and not aligned to anything that is remotely close to what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I had an example where I think uh, a week after we, we closed the deal, an engineer came to me with a letter of resignation. And I was like, well, what's this? And in conversation, I realized he was out of town when the kickoff happened. He wasn't around and didn't pay attention to some of the communications that were being sent. He thought he was out of the job. And I quickly had to kind of raise the flag and you know, pull him aside and show him a lot of TLC that, no, this is, I don't want you writing thing. your own story. <laughs> this is the story you need to follow. Uh, and that was insightful. And what, you know, if you said you were going to spend a dollar on retention, how much of it is getting down to the people, the common folk, not, not the people that are cashing out or uh, maybe rolling a little bit over? Or is there a discipline process for you guys? I mean, I, th I think down? here in, uh, in the tech sector, it's spread love. Yeah. Everyone, people aren't joining startups just for the sake of like, hey, it's going to be fun. No, it's like, I'm going to make some sacrifices by not joining a big company because maybe there's a better payout for me. And I think you've, you know, you've got people who approach it that way. I remember back in the dot coms, I had friends who I can't remember if, you know, options were getting vested, like maybe at three months or six months, but they were rotating through jobs. And I had one person who approached it as like, this is the way to build up my portfolio. I'm going to execute my 83, I'm going to execute an 83B, I'm going to, you know, buy whatever options I have, and in four years I'll have, I'll be diversified across, you know, seven or eight different companies, and if three or four of them pop, I'm good. So I think it, it, it rolls in this, you know, environment, that rolls down. Now, you, you've worked on a ton of deals in your career. What, what are the common missteps uh, that you've seen with regard to, you know, maybe a transaction you completed and there was enormous flight risk and you guys didn't hedge it ahead of time or you put the wrong, um, you, you yeah. put the wrong hurdles in place to keep people there. Well, I'm wearing long sleeves to hide the battle scars. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it for me, when you think about the people, comes back to the culture and perhaps a mismatch between what you think you're buying and what's there and, and perhaps in diligence you're not able to tease out some of the specifics that really you know are germane to okay we do it like this they do it like that how do we bridge that gap um, 
I remember one, uh, I'll give you one example, and it, and it comes to a, a key technology. We, at Cisco, we purchased Tanberg, which was the video conferencing company. And Tanberg was, was very strong in how they viewed what were the best practices around video conferencing, even to the point of, we have an opinion of what background color makes you look the best on video. <laughs> And I remember we went into one of their small engineering centers and we were, we had a facilities guy in there painting the walls and an engineer came in and just tore me a new one. Like, why would you do this? Like, we have scientific research and it's proven. And I was like, sorry, we buy you. <laughs> that was a, little, a tougher message to deliver. But um, we realized that, that their use of technology, their own te technology of video was ingrained in ways that we hadn't discovered through diligence. And uh, it really caused a, you know, a hiccup here or there that um, made us you know, step back and, and reevaluate some things. Good. I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of mishaps that I think we try not to repeat and we try to learn from them, but inevitably there's a few that always happen. I think that the hardest one to deal with is Corp dev tends to take this approach where they give you a number, a retention number, and they're like, okay, this is it. And then you look at it and you're like, wait, it, it makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that is probably the hardest one. And since we're two separate groups, like bridging that gap and getting to a consensus where it should be more of a bottoms up approach and we should have the conversation before we actually say this is the number that we're gonna um, utilize would be important. And then another thing is not looking enough at the middle and bottom mm -hmm. tiers of the talent. So you focus a little too much on, you know, the target has identified that these are the key you know, key people you should keep. These are the named employees, but they don't really tell you a little bit about the rank and file. And you know, we actually have a lot of data that we look at from a retention perspective and a performance perspective, and they're usually the ones that do the best. If we look at acquisitions, those people do much better than the CEOs or the CFOs or the COOs of sure. the world that come in. So those two are certainly things that I think are pretty big. And then the third one I would say is we do a lot of acquisitions that are remote for us. You know, we're Redmond based and the mothership has a lot of pool and we buy a lot of companies that are in the Bay Area or elsewhere and not connecting them to that mothership is a really big issue. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're starting to do a little bit more of is when we do a remote acquisitions, bring a person from the engineering team who's gonna be embedded and stay with them for the next two years. So they're That's involved right. in the diligence process too? They're involved in the diligence process. They're part of the engineering organization. They know what the vision, mission, and strategy of yeah. the acquisition is. And now we're gonna drop them off and they're gonna be living and breathing within that new space for the next two years. So That's that would be like a partner of Todd's as the <coughs> integration leader, that individual would be embedded in? It would actually be someone from the engineering team. Yeah, yeah, I think the that's, engineering that's, team. That's, yeah, but he would be a partner at yes. Todd's yeah. because yeah. he runs integration. Exactly. Too. And yes. so we've noticed that that makes a big difference. It makes them feel connected and then it makes them kind of buy that story and stay more engaged at the end of the day. So you're, you're doing both selling while you're doing the diligence process. You're doing <laughs> a little selling, right? So you want to get that person front and center. Correct. Okay. How does that differ from your I mean, it's say, I mean, a lot of those are very, sound very similar. Um, I think, you know, to things that we've, lessons that we've learned, I mean, I think there's, there's one that we really heavily stress is, is that the spot, we put a lot of emphasis on the sponsor, making sure that the team understands what's going on, keeping them informed, making, you know, if people understand the mission, the story, that, the, you know, feel the value, that just shows all these indications. So we do a couple things that are overt is, is that one, we actually survey the employees several times. And we use that as kind of, hey, you know, it's an opportunity to come back to the sponsor and say, they have no clue what they're supposed to be doing. That's a problem. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, that's, and we've seen that a few times because you know, sponsors get busy or they, there's a reorg or there's a lot of change or they think, you know, we, we have a really good system for bringing in groups of employees that are fresh off the street. And if it's a small aqua hire of four or five people, I'll be candid, they can kind of get lost. And so this is a way for us to kind of surface that back up. Um, the other one we do, and it's, this is kind of ingrained in the culture of Google, and it's, it's an oddity, and it took me a little while to figure it out, is this, the engineers actually run the show, and the engineers can actually vote their manager off the island. And so I actually <laughs> sit down with folks and say, you know, if you've got a whole cohort of brand new folks that have come in that are now reporting to you, and they're not unhappy, they're very unhappy, your perf scores, which is, you know, the, our performance scores, sure. are gonna tank and you're gonna be in the spotlight. And some believe me, some don't. 
but we usually have and have conversations to kind of address that. So it is a, a correcting factor there. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned you know the aqua hire is getting lost in the shuffle because yeah. I, I did a like a four month consulting gig back in 2014 at Google doing some payments work and. I'm trying to remind me if the acronym is right, TCV or TVC? TVC, Temp Vendor Contractor, yeah, yeah. Temp Vendor Contractor. Yeah. So Monday morning they say what building you gotta go into and you literally show up and there's 400 other people yes. and you're marched in, it's like, I don't know, college registration. Here, here, here's your name, no, it, <laughs> here's your laptop, here's your ID, go forth. I mean, wow. And that's kind of what, so I can see yeah. why teams would get lost in that. I mean, I, you know, I, yeah, we did break an, a record earlier this year where we onboarded a thousand people in one week, and that was not from an acquisition. Um, so you know, it is it is like yeah, yeah. enrolling in college, and yeah. so it is. I mean, the, the nice thing is is that a lot of that's geared to kind of treat people, you know, train people. And if they're a junior engineer and maybe have not had a whole lot of jobs, that's perfect. But if they're mid career, that's like, wait a minute, I I already know this stuff. Now tell me how to operate in this place. And that's the part where we need to make sure we're covering and making sure that there's um, resources and tools for them. Um, and what are, what are you, when you introduced yourself, you talked about selling. Yeah. And I know that we talked in the prep call that you're doing more yeah. selling, but you take a piece of a lot of the divestitures that you have. But what are some common missteps oh. on the sell side? We've made a few. We're learning still. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest one that we have is, is that we're a very open culture. And um, an example would be um, when Eric Schmidt was at the board, he actually would come to the company and have a company-wide meeting, and he'd walk through the board meeting notes. And he would disclose kind of what we talked about at the board. So that's kind of a level, that's a baseline of kind of what we, how we share things. So team members and management, when we're thinking about divesting a team, spill the beans super early. And they want to they want to tell people that hey we're thinking about divesting you, and it's like <laughs> then the next question is what when where how and it's it, and so you know what happens is we just took a highly functioning team and we just <laughs> slammed them down to the bottom of the Maslow pyramid and we have to kind of bring them back up and that is like the case study that we keep telling them is, is just because you sh you want to tell them it's not the right thing to do at this moment you know we need to ask some questions we need to be able to answer some questions that are really basic. And a lot of times we bring the, you know, I'll sit down with the executive and say, if I was going to tell you that you were going to be divested tomorrow, what would you think? And they're like, ah, uh -huh. and I'm like, now we need to think about, it. until we have those answers, let's not tell everybody yet. And that's hard because it's counter to our culture. And that is a place where we really have to spend a lot of time struggling to keep people from spilling the beans. I yeah, mean, I think, you know, when you look at like a specific leader or a series of leaders that are really running the organization, um, one thing that you know has been a misstep that we've seen is, you know, and this is a I'd say a, an aptitude that I'm getting better at, but being understanding earlier in the diligence process to what degree is a, a specific leader or leadership team going to look after their flock? Yeah, are they going to look after their own? And we've had a few deals where you know they've, as we've looked at them on paper through diligence, it's almost a flat structure. And then they come, they come through the negotiation process and get onboarded. And next thing you know, I'm looking, the, looking at them in the directory. I'm like, well, this is interesting. You got an SVP, you got two VPs, you got maybe a director and a manager. That sure isn't flat. <laughs> um, and so, so that's an, kind of a, an organizational perspective. And then I, I, I see over time interesting behaviors that represent perhaps hey, I don't feel I got taken care of, you know, on this deal. You know, my, you know, I used to be, you know, able to just walk into the, 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 the executive's room and now I'm two levels down. And so interesting, you know, nuances around how org design just kind of plays out, you know, over the course of time. And then the flip side, which we haven't talked about, is what is it like for your employee population when a new company yes. comes in and you're like, well, hey, well, where's my love? Yeah. Like you're yeah. showing them all the love. What about what we're doing? Yeah. Want some equity here. Yeah. 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 That's great. Natalia, how about, you know, is title and role changes? And I mean, Microsoft is huge. All you guys are quite large. And you're buying a lot of founder-led businesses and smaller businesses. They come in. Yesterday they were the CEO, and now they're the equivalent of a manager. Yeah. Well, how does that work? It's super challenging, and I feel like it's one of those things you have to take a deal by deal and really try to understand what matters to that group in particular. Sometimes it is title. Um, sometimes it's actually more like the, the role and responsibilities that they're going to have. 
and sometimes it's equity. And so you have to, as you're working through the transaction, get a read for what matters for this group in particular. And if, you know, even if it's like one company and the key people have two to three different things that are different for them as far as what's important, which ones do you want to retain the most? And in our case, it's engineers. You know, we really care more about the engineers than anybody else, CEOs. You know, we usually will want to keep for, some are temporary, some we actually want to keep for a couple of years. But so we really look at that and it's, it's a hard conversation that you have to have and you have to tell them, look, you know, yes, you were the king of your small nation. <laughs> now, times, right? yes. now you're going to be an emperor in a much larger country. And so it's, it's trying to get that message across and just let them know, look, you know, it, it's not, a title is not everything. Now you're going to have access to this really cool technology. Now you're going to be able to make an impact on things that are, you know, 10 times the size, like the, the reach of Microsoft versus the reach of a startup, you know, it's, it's quite different. different. So it's a lot about how do you communicate that to that team that is going to be coming in. And do you always integrate? Not always. Okay. So that really, you know, LinkedIn is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on the deal, why we're acquiring it. Uh, the smaller companies that we do, usually we do integrate and it's a flawless integration. For a lot of the studios on the Xbox side, we leave them quite standalone because to them, you know, like having that autonomy and having the right title is important. So we really look at it on a transaction by transaction basis and determine what, what's the best approach from an integration so perspective. That, so that backs into your comments of engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, I mean, driving economic value is more than retention about engagement. Todd, what about you guys? Are you always integrating and how do you guys handle the whole title thing? You know, it, 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 from the perspective of are we always all integrating, I think the three of us can always say it's a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it depends on what the, the, the goal of the deal is. You know, sometimes you want to let a certain aspect of the technology incubate and stay away from the mothership and, you know, let's prove that out by giving a little, you so know, you don't funding. destroy the value. Yeah, you don't want to destroy the value. Um, <laughs> You know, sometimes it's, no, we're going to give them the bear hug and uh, we're going to integrate, you know, quick and fast and, you know, questions that are asked, well, we're going to give them the, you know, here, here's our standards and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll move forward on that. But I think it, it really depends. And it, it, this is where you really got to make sure that early on when you think about kind of what are the goals of the deal, you've got that a, a point of view uh, established early. We have very formal ladders and ladder, uh, ladders and levels. And we definitely, if, and the reason, if you want to stay separate, that means that you're on an island, which means you, you're kind of on an island, which means you can't transfer into the rest of the company, which is usually most people go, well, wait a minute, I don't want to be that separate. Um, but when we talk about it, we definitely have some folks that you know push for, well, I heard that I need to be a level seven. And I'm like, well, you could be, but we're, right now we're assessing you as a six. We actually have data where we've tracked, where we've pushed somebody up. And I'm totally open to showing them the retention numbers and saying, of the folks that we pushed up to seven, most of them left. And so, you know, if you're telling me that that's, you know, you, that's what's important to you, go for it. But I want to tell you, it's going to be a rougher piece, uh, particularly as we. So you're disclosing that. We'll we'll folks. actually disclose kind of our curves of what the levels are and where the employees are because we feel like we need to inform them. I mean. You know, they're kind of looking at it going, well, wait a minute, I, you know, I want to be a level, yeah, I was a, a CEO, I want to be a level 10. You know, that's our highest level. And it's like, well, wait a minute, there's 2% of the company is a level 10. You know, think about that for a second. Who do you think those are? You probably can name those people. Um, you know? <laughs> you know, do not you, disclosed yeah, in the annual well, no, but I mean, you can probably, you know, just in the community, you probably can name them. Do you think you're at that caliber? And most of them are like, mm hmm. I'd like to be, and I'm like, that's a different conversation. Um, but so we definitely do have a, a lot of direct conversations around it. Uh, we will stretch, um, but we really do it under duress. Um, a lot of times it means and then we have to get the sponsor buy-in because they're, they recognize they're gonna take on something that is there. Um, it's also a little bit as, you know, you, you know, if you're coming in a core, you know, bracket, you know, back to your point where I think this is where the people really uh, succeed, that's kind of their, there's a cohort already there. As you get further up, you know, people have been either come in and have done great things and have demonstrated that, and there's a little bit of, hey, you got to show us what you can deliver at, you know, a, a, above a seven, eight, nine. So, you know, there's a little bit of, okay, if you're going to come in at that level, you need to be prepared to, you're going to be under scrutiny. And, you know, back to, you know, be careful what you ask for. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll help you there, but at some point here, you need to really be responsible because it's kind of the way we operate. Good. 
Well, before, we have just a couple minutes before we yeah. take some questions, but uh, William had referred to, we yeah. have done a couple of uh, research pieces. Uh, the third one actually is on culture this year. Guys are more than willing to participate. Th this was, what are the people drivers of economic values? So there's seven identified uh, on the buy side and four on the sell side. And then we agree with all you guys that it is about culture and careers and being part of the brand, but money also plays a role in that. And uh, last year, at the end of the year, we published uh, this with a lot of numbers that frankly don't exist currently today in the marketplace across broad business and geography. Uh, most retention is tied to a percentage of pay. The numbers are in here. And then in focus groups that we did around the world, we recognized that there was not a documented repeatable process that was available out there in the marketplace. And, and this is a blueprint to help you think through uh, how to segment employees. You know, who do you need to keep short term, midterm and long term and what vehicles you can leverage to lock them in. So with that, we have a few minutes left. Uh, why don't we take some uh, questions so you guys can get to the bar <laughs> on time. <laughs> Can you give him the microphone so maybe we, I'm not sure I heard that. I heard something about Silicon Valley. And so how hard to sell a Silicon Valley now to when you're trying to bring new target, you know, a new target uh, employees and integrate them with, with Google? It is tough. I mean, you know, the, the house, people are now know that the housing, housing is expensive. Um, I think a lot of people also look at it from a perspective of, you know, if you want to be in technology, it's kind of the center. Uh, there are now, you know, we also have a, fairly distributed offices. We have a very huge New York office um, that we keep just marching further and further into the Hudson uh, as we buy property. <laughs> and the next joke is a cruise liner because we run out <laughs> of space. Um, but, you know, and we have a big engineering office in Zurich. We have some in Sydney. But you know, definitely there's a, you know, to be super effective, we still feel like you need to be in the Bay Area. And it is a challenge. I mean, the, I, I think I saw in Palo Alto, anybody making under $250,000 is eligible for a housing subsidy, a tax credit. <clears throat> I need um, those options vested right now. Well, <laughs> and, and back to that, you know, we do do sometimes when we're bringing people in from other areas, we do accelerate their first year back to so they have a down payment so they can change, you know, buy a home or you know, get a condo or get themselves situated. I mean, we did, a, we did a small aqua hire of 10 people and there were 10 people that were all engineers. They were distributed across North America and no one lived in the Bay Area. Yeah. And the first time they all met in person was when we kind of did our day one, like, hey, let's get the team together. It's, I, we did a deal like that too, where that was the first time when we actually onboarded them, that was the first time they all had been in the same room. Yeah. And yeah, it was like, I realized at that point, I'm like, okay, I gotta let you guys just talk for a little while. You're, like, you're already taller than I thought you were. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I do feel like there's, there's that. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic out there. That's great. When you think about uh, earnouts, you know, what are your guys' view on earnouts? Just as far as uh, from a strategic way to keep people motivated, do you think it's a uh, obviously, there's the earnout horror stories, or you're not giving me enough resources. But what have what have been your experiences with with an earnout as a way to keep people motivated? Personally, not a huge fan, uh, specifically because we don't buy a lot of the companies that we buy are not because of a product. We buy them because of a cool technology. I mean, yeah, like IP, or because they're good talent of something that we're going to then implement into a bigger product. And so there's really no easy way of tracking. And then it becomes this really fuzzy light, and it, it's just something that we try to avoid, like the plague, if we can. I think I don't think there's a perfect metric out there you can tie an earnout to. You know, you bring a company in, and you know, you fall in love with this growth rate, or maybe, you know, this milestone that they're going to hit, and boom, they come into the mix of your existing organization, and. It's like you know throwing the chips up in the air. You don't know sometimes how they're going to fall. So, you know, there you know it could be a good intent, and maybe you know there's I say still development and refinement of how how one in this corporate development space goes about doing that the right way. It's a slippery slope. I mean, you measure 
you measure one metric probably different than they measure it. Uh, I, yeah, you know, one guy's like, oh, we'll look at revenue. And we're like, well, no, we're looking at billings. That's right. Yeah, or no, bookings yeah, or yeah. what have Just, you, you know. Yeah. Or they'll they'll start fudging the results. Yes. So you know, like you'll you'll Optimize reach out to them that, and yeah. they'll say, okay, you know, show me the metrics, and they're like, oh well, this is what we got, and then you talk to their manager, and they're like, no, 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 actually, that's not what things look like, and so you have to be <laughs> super careful about it. Yeah, that's a great question. No. <laughs> it comes up, and we yeah, we pretty much say no. We yeah. just <laughs> I mean, I just it's just you know, it, what, what what's driving it? You know, what what's your motivator then? You know, is it are you looking for an exit? Are you looking for a period of time? You know, those are, that's an opportunity to have that conversation. Um, yeah, I just, we did. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I, can I sorry, add a quick one? Um, with regard to some of the standalones, LinkedIn, for example, can you talk about some of the, the pros and cons of keeping that employee set separate and how you might address that in future deals to, preserve the independence and at the same time manage that they're all yeah. part of one organization. I think the biggest lesson we've learned from LinkedIn is when Satya, when your CEO tells you this is going to be a standalone company, try to understand what standalone means yes. because it means very different things to very different people. So when he said it, I think he had the idea that, you know, they're going to run their day-to-day -day business the way they've been doing it. In their mind, it meant they're going to be completely separate no back-end system is going to be integrated, which is not what we wanted. And so really mapping out the pros and cons of, well, should we integrate you know, accounts receivable? Should we integrate, you know? So just really map down what independence means. And there are certain things that may make sense to leave completely standalone. Then there's others that really make absolutely no sense. Just to give you an example, when Satya's book came out, he wanted to send it to the entire company. LinkedIn didn't get it because they were standalone and as such, they could not get anything from Microsoft. And so it's really very, very tricky. And so, you know, and we do a large range of how we integrate acquisitions. You know, there's a rapid full integration to completely stand alone. And I think you really have to understand what you're trying to get out of it. And if what you're trying to achieve is don't, don't do any disruption, there's a lot that you can do by still integrating the back end. Could have, could have been as easy as they were on Macs and they didn't want to have a window machine in there. You can that, have Macs. <laughs> I, sometimes those become religious arguments. No, no, yeah. It's amazing. Hi. Um, so I'm curious, do broad uh, aqua hire strategies work? And, and if they do, what went wrong with the Marissa Myers shopping spree uh, at Yahoo? Oh. Ooh. I think Equihires done right and very strategic Equihires are valuable. I think if you start doing it as a way to circumvent your recruiting channel, you're really just hiding something that you should fix. Yeah. And I think that's, that's that, and we really push back on, when we see them, we were actually like, why aren't we just recruiting these people? And um, yeah. Yeah, I think there are certain spaces that are nascent technologies where it's hard to recruit. If, if you don't have a team and you have a technology that you want to develop in the next two to three years and you really have to get to market quickly, then acquire is probably the right strategy. Otherwise, you're overpaying for you know, attracting talent that probably doesn't want to be part of your company. Yeah, or there could be some inertia that you have in your business that's just not going to allow you to get to where perhaps that small team is and they may be nine months ahead, 18 months ahead of where you could be and it, it just makes economic value to say we're gonna we're gonna go out and pay a, a lot of money for these people. That's right. <laughs> How do you incentivize the, those aqua hires when oftentimes you have a predestination for them that they're gonna plug into versus continuing to make that thing that excited them? I know for like one of our small ones, it was, it was really a, a confirmation back to them that look, the original journey that you're on, we still want you to do that. And James mentioned this and, and Talia mentioned this too. There's, there's a bigger aspect of the organization you're now part of and a scale that you can now hook that into that will, you'll, you, the tremendous amount of opportunity there will blow your mind. So, you know, on one hand, it's kind of the best of both worlds. I get to keep doing what I'm doing because I was, that's what brought, the, the excitement of being part of the small team is what hooked me. Mm -hmm. 
and now I get to do it in a, on a grander scale as the end result is, you know, a big reward. Good. Well, wine is waiting for us. <laughs> These guys did a great job. Thank you very much.